when I'm in turmoil, when I can't think, when I'm exhausted and afraid and feeling very, very alone, I go on walks. It's just something I do. I walk and I walk. Sooner or later, something is going to come to me. Something that makes me feel a little less like jumping off a building. Aren't those great words? I wish those were mine. But that's a quote from author Jim Butcher. And it really describes the way I was feeling on one of my walks. You see, things really weren't going my way. I'd been out of my tech career job since the economic bust of 2008. My photography business wasn't really picking up the slack. And a lot of other things were really just bringing me down. As a matter of fact, I was rather in the dumps. This happened about, oh, a year ago. Okay, to be exact, it was 358 days ago. The reason I know that is because it was the autumnal equinox. That's the day when the length of the night and the daytime are exactly equal. From that point forward in the northern hemisphere, the, day, the nights were going to be longer, the days were going to be shorter, until the vernal equinox in March. When I asked what day it was, I was kind of sad. I mean, even though the day was very pleasant, I mean, the temperature was great, the sun was out, there wasn't too much wind, fall had arrived. Now, don't get me wrong, autumn has the really great things going for it. For example, harvest, or the autumn colors, football. But you know what? Fall is not my favorite season. Spring is. It's when everything is new and fresh and reborn. I can go out on hikes with my camera and take photos of the early spring wildflowers, like the pasque flower or the bloodroot. I'm also a big fan of summer. On summer, I can go out on these hikes and I can take pictures of butterflies. For example, the black swallowtail, or the northern pearly eyed, or the viceroy, or my favorite, the tiger striped swallowtail. But on this autumnal equinox, only one thing was going through my head winter was coming. The cold, hard winter when everything I love to photograph is dead and gray. And just when I thought it couldn't get any worse, I started thinking about my own personal life. I was now in my 50s. My kids were growing up and starting lives of their own. I realized I had reached my own personal autumnal equinox. And the winter of life was coming. Depressing. However, I continued on my walk. I reached the bottom of the hill and I made a turn on the next leg of my journey. And I started to think a little bit more about the seasons. You know, there's four of them. Spring, summer, winter, and fall. You know, man, I was getting ahead of myself. I was only halfway through the seasons. There were two full seasons to go. There were many more photographs to be made. There were the autumn wildflowers, or the uh, harvest, or the fall colors. And looking forward into winter, I'd have even more time to look at the photos I had taken over the course of the year. And I'd finally have time to work with them and figure out the best way to share them with the world. Even better yet, I became aware that I had two full seasons of my adult life left. I went from feeling a little bit depressed to feeling a bit motivated. It turns out my walk was going to be memorable. It got me thinking about the seasons about journeys and purpose. So, what causes the seasons? I mean, many of you probably remember this from elementary or middle school science. Our planet is very cleverly tipped, 23 and a half degrees from the plane in which it circles the sun. That means half of the year, the northern hemisphere is tipped toward the sun, giving us longer days and warmer temperatures. The other half of the year, we're tipped away from the sun, giving us longer nights and cooler temperatures. This gives our planet great moderation in temperature and avoids extremes for any one location on the planet. And now this might need not seem very impartial, but it's sort of like Goldilocks would say, this is just right. It seems like this is just the optimal conditions for life to thrive on a planet. And many other things are impacted or influenced by these seasonal changes. For example, weather patterns. 
or our prevailing currents and winds. As a matter of fact, those favorable winds are what allowed the European explorers to discover the New World and more during the days of the sailing ships. The change in seasons also impact, impact the epic migration journeys of animals, birds, insects, and even people. And I don't mean just spring breakers or snowbirds. It wasn't the first time I thought about epic journey. From an early age, the natural world and the universe really kind of inspired the young person I was. The planets, the earth, the stars, the galaxies, everything inspired the citizen scientist in me. Thanks to my grandmother and my mom, I can share with you what it looked like in the summer of 1969 for a kindergarten creative to watch the Apollo 11 mission to the moon. I was able to document this in pencil and very cheap watercolor, but there it is. The spark to me on this journey led me to think a whole lot more about how and why people make journeys. Journeys like on the sailing ships or that epic journey to the moon. Journeys from college to career. Journeys from making a living to making a life. I started to refresh my memory about old history lessons. And then I had to fill in the gaps with new information. But looking way back kept bringing me forward back to the stars and the seasons. As the Earth travels around the sun in its annual journey, the tilt of the Earth and the changing seasons seem to make the location of the uh, rising and setting of the sun on the horizon change daily, from December to June, moving north and then back again south for the remainder of the year. These global, cycle these global cycles have been going on year after year for millennia. And these cycles were recorded and studied since ancient times. Sometimes I don't think we give our ancient ancestors enough credit. For example, the uh, Viking mariners of old, they were able to use that information of where the sun rose and set, and utilizing some pretty sophisticated tools for the time, like the bearing circle or the sun shadow board, they were able to identify their location or their north and south position. This allowed Viking explorers such as uh, Eric the Red or Leif Erikson and other Vikings, along with observations of currents, birds, and maritime animals, they were able to travel from Scandinavia over open ocean to the Iceland, to Greenland, and then on to North America. Other seafarers of the time were really limited to staying within sight of land. Now, of course, navigating by sun only works in the daytime, right? So at nighttime and in other locations in the northern hemisphere, there's another guide for the traveler to keep you on course, and that's Polaris. Polaris goes by a lot of other names. For example, the Angel Star, the Lode Star, the Navigator Star, or as many of you probably know it, the North Star. Of course, the sun you know, will travel across the sky and change its position in the sky. However, Polaris is a constant. Being that it's 27 million times farther away from Earth than the Sun, the changing seasons do not impact Polaris. It seems to appear directly above our North Pole. All the other stars and constellations in the night sky seem to rotate around Polaris. Now, you would think such an important star would be very, very bright. But if you look at Polaris and the surrounding stars, it really doesn't stand out very well. But if you know how to find the Big Dipper or the Little Dipper, and I bet you a good chunk of you do, you can easily find Polaris. If you're able to find Polaris, the navigator is then able to measure the degree of difference between Polaris and the horizon to determine your location of latitude. Again, the north and south position. I learned that uh, you know, through my studying of history that latitude is really important on a journey. But I was finding in history that, there are, uh, that there's another very important factor to finding your position, and that is longitude. Up until about the 1700s, finding longitude was uh, determined by a method called dead reckoning. 
In other words, an estimate of your time and speed from a fixed point, like your uh, home port. And you know, that's really subject to a lot of error, especially when you think about the best way to tell time at the time was a sand dial. And the best way to determine speed was how much rope was pulled over the edge of the boat in 28 seconds. Back in 1707, over 1,500 sailors died in one incident. The British Navy was returning home from battle, and they encountered some storms. After those storms, the navigators felt that they were back safely in the English Channel and on their final leg. Unfortunately, due to errors in navigation, four of the ships crashed into the Scilly Islands. This prompted the British government to create something called the Longitude Act. And that was really just a prize, a monetary prize, to anyone who could uh, create a simple and practical way to find uh, longitude. This led a carpenter, his name was John Harrison, to take up the lifetime challenge to solve the problem and earn the prize. Harrison spent 40 years working on an accurate timekeeper. He had worked you know, part-time fixing clocks, and he knew that the best way to establish longitude was to have an accurate timekeeper, one that wasn't impacted by the rocking of a ship or the humidity on an ocean voyage. Forty years it took him, and he developed that accurate timekeeper. And at the age of about 80, Parliament finally awarded him the majority of the prize, and we moved into the modern age of navigation. Now, most of you, I bet you have it on your phone right now, these days we have GPS, and most of you have that right there on your phone. You're able to get turn-by-turn -turn directions to your favorite restaurant instantaneously. But it wasn't too long ago that we still had to look up at the sky and use celestial navigation to determine our position. One very inspirational journey, it's always, always been an inspiration to me, is the exploration of Ernest Shackleton. Or maybe you've heard about this journey. Ernest wanted to be the first one to cross the continent of Antarctica. And they did that, in, they were attempting to do that in 1914. They left in a three-masted ship called the Endurance. And just 200 miles short of their destination, the Endurance was trapped in the pack ice. They were trapped and drifted along with that ice northward for almost a year. Their hope was that they would break free and be able to travel back. Unfortunately, the Endurance was crushed by the ice. This forced the crew into lifeboats, and they had to cross the ice and open water for 350 miles to get to Elephant Island. Now, the only way they could do that is by understanding their position through celestial navigation. There's a picture of the Endurance trapped in the ice. That celestial navigation also allowed Ernest Shackleton and five of his crew members to get into this lifeboat and row 720 more miles to South uh, Georgia Island to obtain rescue for their crew. Amazing feat. And even more recent, some other uh, situations that required celestial navigation. You might remember that kindergarten creative I was talking about the moon mission. If you look back at Apollo, there were several instances where we had to turn back to celestial navigation to understand position. For example, this is Apollo 12. Apollo 12 was struck by lightning as it left the launch pad, knocking out their navigational computer. The crew had to rely on celestial navigation to confirm their position and complete their mission. Many of you probably have also seen the movie Apollo 13, right? And you've seen where Tom Hanks' character has to you know, develop a celestial fix in order to determine their location after the explosion on the spacecraft. Now, the Hollywood version has a little bit more drama, but of course, astronaut Jim Lovell and the rest of the crew depended on that location for their survival and the journey home. I wanted to learn all this history and tell you some of these stories because it would give us a framework to discuss your meaningful journeys always have a destination or a goal or an impact. Even if the destination is unknown, a journey has a reason for being even if it's just to go out and seek the end. It all starts with the season. Remember I told you that I felt that I was in the autumnal equinox of my life? As I look out here and I see so many students, I know you're in a different season. You're in the vernal equinox. Spring. 
You're just getting ready to start on your journeys. But it really doesn't matter. Whatever season you're in, remember the seasons are the large, big, macro elements of our world. That's what causes the prevailing winds and currents on our journeys. So, is there a demand for a particular occupation? Is there a need for a new business or a need for social change? What journeys can you take to make the world a better place? Like the Viking Mariners who studied the seasons and learned the tools to determine their location, we are also studying and learning the tools to identify our location on our journeys through our education, our careers, and our work experiences. And understanding the exact time will help us dial in that location even more. Remember, timing is everything. Many of you are going to know the exact time very soon when you reach your graduation. Others of us will be working very hard, like John Harrison, to figure out the exact time. One thing that I know for certain, though, on our journeys, we're not going to always have smooth sailing. Sometimes the winds will die. We'll be left, we'll be left adrift. Sometimes our charts and maps will be wrong. Sometimes we'll be hit by storms and blown off course, and our confidence will be rattled, and we'll be doubting. And when you are rattled and lost and doubting, I want you to look for Polaris. Polaris is your purpose. And I like how um, former CEO of Xerox, Ann McCulhey, says it. Who you are, what you are, what you stand for, those are your anchor. It's your North Star. You won't find him in a book. You'll find him in your soul. Purpose offers direction, just as a compass offers, offers direction to a Last September, I realized I had forgotten my purpose. That's to help people reach their potential through creativity, exploration, and education. Now, some of you know your purpose. Some of us have along the way. Others of you don't know your purpose. If you don't know your purpose, I encourage you to go out and find it. And there's some really good reasons for it. I've got some research to back it up. For example, people with purpose have a greater sense of well-being, good health, and longer life. People with purpose have a lower risk of stroke, heart attack, coronary disease requiring a stent or a bypass. People with purpose have better pain management. People with purpose are more engaged with family and coworkers and community, leading to better relationships. And people with purpose have more brain resiliency, 52% less likely to have Alzheimer's, and two and a half less, uh, times more to be free from dementia. And seeing my dad suffer from these, these figures are near and dear to my heart. On a walk just about a year ago, the clouds of my journey parted, and I was able to again find my Polaris. I encourage you to look at your strengths and your gifts, the things that you like to do. I'd like you to look and see where you can contribute to make a difference in the world. It's your world. Find Polaris. Start your journey. Thanks.